Uh, hey guys. Hey guys. Uh, we're here at the Liberty Science Center in Jersey City, New Jersey. Looking forward to a good day. Hey, peace. Robotic surgery? Yep. Ready? Wow. Mark, you want to stand in front of that and do that? Here, hold this. Robot assisted surgery. Oh my god. Oh, I thought you were gonna. It's filming, I think. You are filming. I don't know, I thought it was gonna move. Alright. Oh, here we go. Alright. <laughs> this is That's gross for the doctor, too. Let's go through the test settle. Takes about five minutes. Oh, you have to crawl through there. Right hand on the right wall, you won't go And no cheating with the light. Oh, no, I won't. Okay. It's for my YouTube channel. It's for fun. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's funny. Do you guys want a picture? 
Uh, does it cost money? Huh? Does it cost money? No, like I could use your. Oh your, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Okay, thank you. Right hand, you want to go first? Maybe this one. Is it? Oh no. <laughs> It's dark. I was like, first I was like, what the hell? You know, I was expecting to go straight. All of a sudden, wow. You know, we turn. Wow. Whoa, what is that? I see a red light. <laughs> uh -huh. This is weird. I don't know which way to go. You know what? I'm going to exit. You're going to exit? Yeah. Just Exit. I'm glad I did it though, but I was I was nervous. You know? o'clock. Eat and beat. Where is it? Eat and beat. There it is. Let's do this thing. Time. No, no, no. Two o'clock. What timing? It's uh. Encounter. Meet creatures from our animal collection and learn how they survive. Okay. Yeah. Yep. We're actually moving. Turn. They are tortoises. Cats. I don't know if they have them. They, I don't, that's not them. <laughs> Wait, what's in here, Max? Puffer fish! It goes back to the turtles. This is a wow. snapping turtle. Wait, do you hear him now? Over here, guys. Over okay. here. Oh, yeah, be a dog. That's I'm just going to come over here. live animals here for you today. Do you guys like animals? Yeah! Yeah, I hope so, because I'm going to take some out for you. Before I take my animals out here, there's just a few quick things to keep in mind. All of my animals are smaller than us, and they can get scared, and we don't want that to happen, of course. So when I bring them around in my arms, make sure that we keep our hands to ourselves. We don't want to try to scare them. We don't want to wave in their face, because that could scare them. We also want to keep our voices down. We're not going to yell or shout at my animal friends here because we want it to be a positive experience for them as well. You're welcome to take as many pictures as you like of the animals and of myself as long as you get my good side and that is my right. So keep that in mind, folks. Um, and I'll start off by introducing myself. My name is Chelsea. Everyone say hi, Chelsea. Hi, Chelsea. Good afternoon, everybody. I am the exhibition leader of wildlife and conservation here at Liberty Science Center. I'll be your presenter for today. So the first animal that I'm taking out here, I don't think any of you are going to believe what I have in store. The animal that I'm taking out for you right now is a dragon. What do you think? Is it a fire-breathing dragon? No? Do you think it's a big castle, like castle guarding dragon that has wings? No, it's not. The first animal I have for you is called a bearded dragon, which is a type of lizard. This type of lizard lives in Australia. They generally get to be about 10 years old. Now he is really great at defending himself against predators. That means he's going to try to protect himself from getting eaten because do you think he wants to get eaten? No, 
out. Does any animal want to get eaten? No, of course not. So take a look at his body. Take a look at how spiky his body looks. Those look pretty scary, don't they? Should I touch them? They're very soft, actually. It gives the appearance of being very, very spiky and scary. But in fact, his body with all those spikes is very flexible and soft. He can also puff up his body to make himself look really big and really scary. That way other predators don't want to get him. He gets his name Bearded Dragon because he can puff up his neck too, like a bullfrog. And that makes him look even more intimidating. He doesn't have a real beard like my grandpa does, but he does have that extra pouch on his neck that he can kind of puff up. Now if he wants to see predators too, he has a really good way of doing it. How many eyes does my bearded dragon have? Two. Two, right? Nope. He has three. Yes, my bearded dragon has a third eye on the top of his head. You cannot see it because it's not an eyeball like his other two eyes are, but it's a sensor. It's called a pineal eye, and if he's out in the wild, he's going to be worried about lots of predators, including hawks, eagles, and birds of prey. So when they fly over him, they're going to make a shadow over his head, and that third eye on the top of his head is going to see that shadow, and that's going to help warn him of danger. So that's a great way for him to avoid being eaten. Now, not only is he a prey animal, he can get eaten, but he's a predator too. He can eat other animals. What do you think he likes to eat? Fish. Fish is a good guess. He loves his insects. Crickets are one of his favorite foods here. And he also likes fruits and vegetables too. Now guys, I will come around and I will let you touch my bearded dragon if you would like to. If you do choose to touch, we are going to use just one finger. So everyone hold up one finger for me. Wonderful. Everyone take a look at that finger. Good finger. That's going to be your touching finger, all right? And you're going to touch nice and gently just on his back like I'm doing right here. We're not going to scratch. We're not going to squeeze or grab. We're just using that one finger to touch. I'll start on my left hand side. We're not going to be able to hug him. That's a good question. <laughs> But you know what? He doesn't really take hugs like we do. He might be afraid of a hug by a big person like us. No, I don't say the back. You're welcome to touch as well. Now, when you do touch, please don't put your fingers in your mouth or on your face or in your friend's mouth. I'll come around with hand sanitizer for you as well once we're done here. Very good job, everybody. And you can feel he's kind of bumpy. He's not as spiky as he seems, but he is a little bit bumpy in texture. And that's going to help him in our environments. Give him in the back, guys. Very nice job. It's your touching finger, okay? You have some friends in the corner. If anybody else want to touch, have to step up here because I can only reach so far. There you go. Very good job. Oh, is he spiky? I don't know if I mentioned it before or not, but he likes to eat insects. He also likes fruits and vegetables. And there's a big word for that. Does anyone know what word I'm thinking of when an animal eats both plants and meat? Omnivore. Omnivore, very good. He is an omnivore just like us humans. Very good job, guys. Oh, I love the tiger on your shirt. Very nice. We don't have a tiger too, though. Sorry. Yeah, not since he isn't a poker. Very good job, guys. Like I said, I will come around with hand sanitizer afterwards. Ooh, you have a dinosaur on your shirt. We definitely don't have a dinosaur here. He is a little bit bumpy, right? Did I miss anybody? Would you like to try it first? No, that's all right. Okay, I'm going to put my bearded dragon back. You know, let's do something special for him. Let's put our hands up in the air and shake him really fast. Very good job. That's how you clap in sign language. So you're giving my blizzard here a big round of applause without scaring him. All right, as promised, I'll come around with hands in the So if you'd like to wash your hands, have your hands out ready. I'll give you a little bit. Of course, you don't have to use mine. You can already guess what I'm taking out here. Yep, somebody already guessed this, and uh, you guys heard right, I am taking out a Chilean rose here tarantula right now. <laughs> yeah, pretty good reaction there. Now, tarantulas have those hairs on their body for defense. So just like our lizard likes to pretend that he's really big and spiky, our tarantula likes to use her hair. So if she gets scared of an animal trying to eat her, maybe a bird, she's going to take those hairs and she's going to flick them off of her body. Can you guys do that with your hair? I can't do that, right? So when I handle her, I'm not going to be using my bare hands because I don't want to get itchy because those hairs can get very, very itchy. But I am going to use this brush to encourage her to come onto this piece of bark. And once she's on there, I am going to bring her around so everyone can see her up close. 
<laughs> I hear a lot of mixed reactions from the crowd here. So let's talk a little bit more about these animals in the wild. So I said they're going to use their hairs for defense. If that didn't work, what else could they do to protect themselves? Close, close. Someone said sting. That was very close. They can bite. All tarantulas have fangs and they do have venom. So if she was very scared, if she needed to protect herself, she could bite. But she doesn't want to do that unless she absolutely has to. Tarantulas would much rather use their venom for their own food. Just like my bearded dragon, tarantulas here love to eat crickets. So that's one of her favorite foods. When she finds a cricket that she wants to eat, she's going to grab it with her front two appendages called pedipalps, and then she's going to bite it with her fangs. Those fangs inject venom onto the inside, and that pushes up the inside of that cricket, breaking down those soft tissues, turning it into a big cricket smoothie almost. Does that sound good to you guys? Yeah, pretty good. Anyone ever had crickets before? Some people have. Yeah, you know, they're in the gift shop if you're interested. But anyway, that's how she's going to eat her food. Now, is anyone here afraid of spiders and tarantulas? It's okay if you are. I heard quite a few reactions that sounded like fear when I brought her out, and that's okay. That is perfectly fine to be afraid of animals like this. I know they get a bad reputation. They're always the bad guys in movies. There's decorations around Halloween time meant to scare you. But you know what? A lot of that has to do with misunderstanding. A lot of people are afraid of these animals because they don't understand them. So let's think about this. They eat lots of insects, not just crickets, flies, mosquitoes, all sorts of insects. If we didn't have spiders or tarantulas in the world, what would happen? Would there be less insects or way too many? Too many, exactly. They would throw off the balance of the entire ecosystem, including mankind. In fact, we wouldn't be around if we didn't have animals like this to keep that balance in the ecosystem. So even if we don't like them, that's okay. Just keep in mind that they are very important, and we do need them in our world. All right, guys, I'm going to put our tarantula back here. Do you want to give her a little round of applause as well? Very nice job. Very nice job, everybody. All right. Let's see, who am I bringing out next? I have some pretty good animals for my last two. My first two are pretty cool too, but these guys are some of my favorites. Let's see. I think my next animal that I'm taking out is going to be one of my absolute favorite types of animals in the world. I love these animals so, so much. It's a type of animal that's a reptile, so very similar to our lizard that I took out in the beginning. It's a little bit different. Here I have a ball python. It's a type of snake that lives in Africa. Snakes in general can get their food in one of two ways. They can either be venomous, like a tarantula, or they can be a constrictor. Which one do you think I have here in my bare hands? A constrictor, yeah, exactly. I would not hold a venomous snake in my bare hands with my health insurance. This is a constrictor. <laughs> so when she finds something she wants to eat, she's gonna grab it with her mouth and then squeeze it really tight with the rest of her body and swallow it whole. But her mouth looks pretty small, doesn't it? You know, let's have a contest. You guys open up your mouth as wide as you can. Ah. Uh, even wider, keep going. Very good job. You guys are great. Those are some big mouths and I mean that in a good way. You can close your mouths now. That was awesome. <laughs> good contest. But if our snake was having that contest with us, she would always win. Snakes have special bones called quadrate bones, which allow them to open up their mouths two to three times the size of their head. That's like us swallowing a watermelon. Has anyone here ever tried to swallow a watermelon? No, I don't think so. Or maybe a basketball is about the equivalent size. So that's how they're going to get their food. Now, just like we were talking about with their other animals, not only is she a predator, she can eat other animals like mice and rodents, but she can get eaten too. Of course, she doesn't want to get eaten. So what she's going to do is she's going to hide. She'll blend in using these beautiful colors on her body. Does anyone know that big word? You can shout it out if you know. Blend me in. Camouflage. Very good. She's going to camouflage or blend into her environment to help her hide from any sort of predators. They also have a very special behavior, too. Do you think she's called a ball python? 
because she likes to play baseball? <laughs> no, maybe basketball? No, of course not, she can't do that. She's called a ball python because she'll curl up into a ball. She'll protect her head and wrap around it with the rest of her body. Now, why would she do that? What is so important inside your head she wants to protect? Your brain, exactly. She's gonna protect her brain by wrapping around him. A few other facts about her. These pythons typically get to be about 48 inches in length. Now, why do you think I said 48 inches and not four feet? I did that on purpose, anyone know? I said 48 inches, not four feet. It's because snakes don't have any feet. <laughs> they did go better. Thank you very much. They do slither. You are right. Very good point to make. They do not have feet because they slither. Very nice. All right, guys. I'll come around and I'll let you touch my ball python here if you would like to. Just like with our last animal, we're going to use how many fingers? One. One, please. Since she's a live animal, we want to make sure that we're not scratching, we're not squeezing. We're just using that one finger gently on her back. All right? I'll start on my right-hand side this time. So if you'd like to touch, have those fingers out and ready. Of course, you don't have to touch if you don't want to. That's all right. No worries. Just put them without. You also might see her sticking out her tongue. Does anyone know what she's doing when she sticks out her tongue? She's smelling. Smelling. Wow, you, a lot of you guys knew that. She's smelling. Exactly. She's coming around. She's saying, ooh, you smell good, or ooh, you smell bad. And that's going to help her out in the wild to find any food that she might want or to detect danger. Oh, you put I'm sorry, sweetheart. Just one finger. Very nice job. I'm going to have to readjust her for just a second here because she's kind of moving around a lot. That's okay. Very good job. Yes. Oh, very good. So just like when you pet a dog, you, you pet from their head down to their tail because their fur goes that way, scales, like on a snake, go one way too. So they all they do go from the head down to the tail. Very good point to make, yes. They do only lay one way. Very nice job. Now same thing as we were talking about with the tarantula. A lot of people don't like snakes, and that's all right. A lot of people are misunderstood about these animals. They have a fear of them, and that's okay. But just like with our tarantula, they do have a very important role in the lions. They eat lots of rodents. So if we didn't have snakes around, there'd be too many rodents in the world. And that would throw off the entire balance of the ecosystem. So once again, even if you don't like them, that's all right. It's important to understand that we need them in our world. And they are very important animals. All right? All right, guys. So I'm going to come around. I'm going to put my snake back, and I'll come around with hand sanitizer. But you know, let's do something else special for her. For her, rather. Did I miss somebody? Yeah? Okay. That one finger, honey. There you go. What did I miss over here? Did I miss anybody over here? One more, okay. No worries. You know what? Let's do something even more special for my snake here. We already give our other animals a round of applause. But you know what? This time, let's put our hands up and let's curl our fingers. And this time, we're going to put our hands in a big circle. There you go. Good job. You're giving my snake here a round of applause. Oh, come on. That was funny. My goodness. I'm proud. You know what my problem is? I think my jokes are funny, but then my snakes just think they're hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> All right, once again, I'll come around with hand sanitizer. So if you like, I'll also tell you that he has a mouth called a beak. Yeah, a, parrot. a parrot has a mouth called a beak. Very good guess. The parrot's over there. Birds have mouths called beaks. Penguins, I heard. Yes, they do have mouths called beaks. Ducks do. But other animals have mouths called beaks as well. Other animals do. Oh, very good guess. A duck is a very good guess. This animal is a little bit different. A platypus? This animal's not a bird. A platypus? They're very close, very close. This animal rhymes with the word ortis. Ortis. <laughs> no, it totally does not rhyme with ortis. This is the tortoise that I have out here, guys. This is a red-footed tortoise. You might have seen them already in the very front of our Eat and Be Eaten exhibit. We do have quite a few out in the front there. Now, this guy is one of our adult males. Uh, he's in his teens. They can live up to 50 or 60 years old. Some tortoise species can even get over 100, like the Aldabra and the Galapagos tortoises. Now, he is a wonderful example of defense. So we talked about the tarantula with her hair. We talked about how the snake camouflages and how the bearded dragon has those spikes. What does my tortoise have to help defend itself? His shell, of course. 
So when he gets here, he's going to go inside of his shell. A few things about his shell might surprise you. So his shell is actually made out of bone. That's why it's so hard. But it also has something else on top. If you take your hands and you touch your hair for a second, feel your hair. All right, good job. Now feel your fingernails. The stuff that you're touching in your hair and your fingernails is called keratin. And that's a special protein that's in your body. That same protein, that keratin, is the same stuff that a turtle or tortoise shell has as well. So it's nice and hard to protect him. Just like our ball python wanted to protect her what? Her head and her brain, exactly. Our tortoise is going to protect his head and his brain too. He'll put his head in first and then his legs to protect them as well. A lot of times you see cartoons or movies where a turtle or a tortoise leaves their shell and they're just in their underwear and then they come back. Have you seen those? I've seen them. Really embarrassing. It's also false. Turtles and tortoises can never ever leave their shells. It's a part of their bodies. So I want you guys to find a part on your body called our spine. It's your backbone. Feel right along your back here. It kind of tickles. That's your backbone. It's nice and hard, right? It keeps all your organs together. Very important for us. Now, if I was to ask somebody, I'm sorry, can I have your backbone, please? <laughs> can I just have it? No? What? Oh, okay, all right. Well, that's not very nice. Would you like, can I have your backbone? No? Oh, can anybody give me your backbone? You can? Okay, give me your backbone. <laughs> No, you can't do that, can you? Thank you, though. That was very nice. But you can't take your backbone out. Just like you can't take out your bones, a turtle or a tortoise can never, ever leave their shell. It's attached to their backbone and to their ribs. So he can never, ever leave it. When he's a baby, he has a baby shell, and it grows with him as he gets bigger and older, too. So a lot of people call a tortoise shell or a turtle shell their house, but it's really not. It's their body because they can never, ever leave it. Now, I will come around, guys, and I'll let you touch my tortoise here if you would like to. Just like with a... Right? Are you going to bite me, though? Yes. Like, oh, my goodness. You were so nice before. You gave me your spine, and now you're going to... Oh, my God. I'm going to stay away from you. Anyway, I'll come around, guys, and you can touch my tortoise here. I'll start on my right-hand side. So feel free to touch yeah, my tortoise. To of course, you don't have to. Once again. I don't know. But he is pretty popular around kind of here. Like He's our very own shell <laughs> Very good job, everybody. Very good job. And once again, I will come around with hand sanitizer for you once we're done touching here. There you go. Make another joke? Uh, okay, this is my favorite joke. What do you call a bear who doesn't have teeth? Bearless. A gummy bear. <laughs> Getting to just have gums? You didn't even laugh. My goodness, you guys are a rough crap. No, it was funny. Oh, thank you. Okay, now you're back to being nice. Okay. <laughs> Did you get a chance to, sir? Wow. There you go. Good job. Thanks for taking turns, everybody. I really do appreciate it. Now, unfortunately, this is my last animal that I have out here for my animal encounter. If you liked my presentation, if you liked my program, if you liked my jokes, again, my name is Chelsea. But if you did not like my program, my name is Joe. <laughs> If anybody has any questions about any of our animals here, I will be sticking around, so you can certainly ask me anything that you like. Once I'm done with uh, everybody touching my tortoise, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. We also have other programs going on today. We have our tamarind feeding, starting at 3 o'clock. And we also have a touch tank up on the fourth floor, starting at 3.30 today. So that's always a lot of fun. Very good job, everybody. All right, I'm going to put my tortoise down.
Okay, I want to start by welcoming everyone here to the Tesla Lightning Show. My name is Michael, I'm one of the science educators here. And a few tidbits, notes before we begin. First, um, as you can see here, the show does get quite loud. So if any time you're on the program, you're feeling uncomfortable, feel free to take off your headsets, place them on the back sides of your chair there, and feel free to exit in the back there. Second note, flash photography. Just witnessed our Tesla coils, and uh, these coils were invented by a prolific scientist named Nikola Tesla, who did a lot of work on electricity in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And he was an advocate of a specific form of electricity called AC. Does anybody know what AC stands for? Get it. Absolutely. It stands for alternating current. And he worked alongside of another prominent scientist, uh, someone who lived here in New Jersey who invented the light bulb. His name was? Thomas yes, Thomas Edison. And Thomas Edison was an advocate of another form of electricity called DC. Does anybody know what DC stands for? Go ahead. Yes, very good. So you had alternate current and direct current. And so they both had a disagreement. And their disagreement hinged upon the question, which form of electricity was more efficient to transmit to homes and businesses? Obviously, Nikola Tesla won that argument because as of today, we're using AC in our homes and businesses. But Nikola Tesla wanted to take it a step further. See, he wanted to transmit electricity wirelessly, with no wires at all. So what he did is that he moved down to Colorado Springs, Colorado in 1899. And he created something similar to what you see here, but his was on a grand scale. See, his was about 80 feet high. And on top of that, he had a 140-foot tower on top of that. Humongous. To give you an idea of what we're talking about, the height from the uh, stage there to the ceiling of this theater is about 30 feet. Okay, so his was just super humongous. And so he realized that he needed to create a lot of electricity, pump it into the ground so that the electricity could travel underneath underground. He would have transmitters many, many miles away that would pick up that electricity, and there you would have wireless electricity. Okay, that was a theory. So what he did, what he did with the help of a local supply company, he used uh, the transformer and he cranked his thing up. His uh, Tesla plug. He cranked it up and he cranked it up and he cranked it up and he cranked it up so high that he blew out, you know, the generator, the transformer, and everyone in town lost electricity. It was a failed attempt. It did not work. And even as of today, it, it doesn't work. Uh, but in any case, we can use these to kind of educate ourselves. So what I like to take a step down onto the stage. Uh, tell you a little bit about how this works. So again, all we do is we just take this and plug it into the wall out socket, wall outlet. And it just takes and delivers electricity from the wall socket into the coils here. And what starts to happen is that the electricity starts to surge and we have the primary coils here and they start to surge, the electricity starts to surge back and forth and back and forth. And that's the alternate current that what tells us we're so fine of. And so every time it changes direction, a magnetic field is formed right about here, and it starts to grow, shrink, grow, shrink. And every time it does that, it pushes up on the electrons on the secondary coil, which are right over here, and it causes the electrons to move back and forth and back and forth. Now, the difference between this and a regular transformer is that this is designed in resonance. Just a technical term. All that means is that every time the electricity changes direction, it adds additional energy, uh, additional voltage, to the uh, Tesla coil there. So if you were to measure the voltage on top here, you would see that it goes to fluctuate. It goes up, down, up, down, up, down. Each time getting higher and higher and higher until it gets to a point where it rips all the air molecules apart. So what you're witnessing is not electricity. Electricity is invisible to us. You cannot see it. What you're seeing is the fourth state of matter, namely plasma. Plasma is basically a bunch of hot, charged air particles. And so what's happening is the air particles are being ripped apart and that's what you're witnessing. Now, uh, this stuff looks like it's really, really cool to play with, and it really is, but we have to be mindful of protecting everything around us, okay? And this is a good way for me to explain what a Faraday cage is. A uh, Faraday cage is basically a metal box. Now, how many folks have a microwave at home? Everyone has a microwave at home. You are proud owners, believe it or not, of a Faraday cage. See, the way the microwave works is that you open up the door, you put the food in, you close the door, and then there's a little bit of a small window that you can see through to see if your food is being cooked. That there is actually one component of a Faraday cage, the other five sides are the other components. And so when you close that door, it keeps everything in, okay? And that's the way a Faraday cage works. So let me kind of show you some of our examples of our Faraday cages up here. We have our big fence there, which protects the movie screen, which is on the other side of that. We have a smaller metal fence right here. It basically protects everything from this point onward. We have our steel metal plate here, which protects everything underneath, and we have our data communication center below us, 
And then we have another example of a Faraday cage, which I'll pick up and show you. It's a little odd, a little unusual. And we have it here. So what I'm going to do to demonstrate how this works, as you can see, we have our bulbs in the back here and one over here. During the first one, you probably know that these bulbs light up. They're not connected to anything. They're not hardwired. Okay? They just sit there. And the reason why they light up is because of the electric field that's generated from both of these coils. It comes right over here and it excites all the electrons and they start to bounce up, move forward, backward, everything, and that's why the light bulb lights up. So what I'm going to do while we're listening to our second song, we will cover this up with our Faraday cage. We will ground it, and then I will ask you during the second song to take notice of this bulb here, see if anything different happens. Alright? So with that said, go ahead and put your headsets on. This will take us into the second song of the day. Alright, let's do this. And your names. 
Henry, Henry, what I want you to do, hold on to this. Maybe you This is just a panic button. So what you're going to do is you're going to step right in, go ahead, okay? And we're going to close the cage and we're going to turn on the, um, the test of course. The only thing that I ask you is you can do whatever you like in there. I really don't care. As long as you don't poke holes through this cage, you'll be fine. You have your headset. Go get your headset, okay? And again, while we're waiting, uh, as long as you don't poke your hands in there, that's not a problem. If you have a cell phone, you want to take pictures, not a problem. You're going to have one side here that's coming out, and you're going to have another on this side over here, so you can take pictures as you like. Uh, Henry, you have a panic button in case anything happens, which never has, but uh, just in case you can hit that button. It shuts everything off, and now uh, we will close the cage, and now uh, we will ask you uh, folks in the audience to go ahead and put your headsets on. Everyone just actually put their headsets on, and uh, let's try this out. So everyone in the cage, uh, put your headsets on. Perfect. shell of the car onto the ground, basically protecting you. And that's the same concept that we have here. Uh, so we get the clear signal, let's go down. Uh, and we'll open up the, uh, I'll open it up, and uh, you'll see there one is safe and sound. Give them a big uh, hand. Okay. So we open up the door. So we'll just close this up, and again, as I said, uh, they're all protected because as the electricity hits the cage, it just goes down to the ground, protecting everybody. And uh, we are good to go. All right. So we've been hearing a lot of music, and so let's talk uh, for a second about sound. Sound is basically a vibration of the air particles around us. Okay. Uh, call it a pressure wave. So the pitch of any sound, as in when I am talking or when someone is singing, is also known as its frequency, the number of ups and downs of that wave that hits your ear in the prescribed time period. Okay. So going back to the top there. Uh, we did mention that all that is is plasma. Plasma is really hot, okay? And it expands your ear very rapidly. And when that happens, that pressure wave, that frequency is created, which hits your ear. So to demonstrate, what we'll do is we'll give you a small sample of plasma. So Ian, let's give him a small sample of plasma. Let's give it to him again. One more time. Okay, so that's just one sample. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add more plasma and you'll start to see how a frequency is created. So Ian, give them a lot more. And that kind of shows you, you know, uh, how we are able to control the frequency by adding more or decreasing the amount of plasma that we generate for able to control the frequency. Lastly, what I want to do is kind of introduce you to our invisible drummer, okay? Uh, you don't see him, that's why he's invisible, but then you're going to hear him in a second. So, invisible drummer, please take it away. How is this control? Well, this actually is hardwired, okay? It's connected to all the computers up over there, and the computers are basically uh, controlling the uh, 
the invisible drop in here. Okay? So we have our invisible dropper, we have our tesla coils, we're gonna uh, combine everything to give you our finale, the third song of the day. However, we need you to put your headsets on. So guess
giant fish.